enjoy. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm delighted to share my experience of pursuing a career in scientific research with you tonight. So before I start, uh, I would like to have a general survey. Who of you are interested in science? Please raise your hands. Okay, there are some people. So actually, a lot of young people are interested in science, but only a few of them would choose scientific research as the lifelong career. So what is the reason? Lack of job security and relatively low income compared with other professions like medical doctors and lawyers are some considerations not to choose scientific research as a lifelong career. But can we change that perception or what can we do? So I would like to share with you my experience. So I was initially trained as a medical doctor and after I graduated from the medical school, I received specialist training in gastroenterology. But however, after I finished the specialist training, I decided to go back to school to study a PhD in molecular biology. So actually, this choice was quite unusual because for gastro gastroenterologists in Hong Kong, it is not uncommon to have a monthly income of over one million. So it is quite silly to go back to school and give up that income. And I made this choice because of one person and one discovery. This is Professor Dennis Lowe, my PhD supervisor. In 1997, he discovered that when a woman is pregnant, the baby's DNA can be found in the circulation of the pregnant woman. So this is a conceptual breakthrough. Because before his discovery, people generally believed that the blood circulation of the baby and the pregnant woman need to be completely separated. Otherwise, the pregnant woman would develop some antibody to attack the baby and kill the baby. So his discovery actually impressed me a lot. And I dream that in the future, this discovery can be translated into clinical benefits. We can develop new diagnostic methods to do prenatal testing just by looking at the blood plasma of the pregnant woman. So conventionally, if we want to do prenatal testing, we need to put a needle of this long into the uterus of the pregnant woman to get some fetal materials. You can imagine how scary this process would be, and also it carries risk of miscarriage. So if we can use the mother's blood to do all the testing and extract the DNA from the mother's blood, that would be fantastic. So what is the reason for performing prenatal testing? The most common reason is to screen for Down syndrome. For a normal person, we, our genome consists of 22 pairs of chromosomes plus the XY chromosome. But in a person affected by Down syndrome, there is one extra copy of chromosome 21. And this extra copy of chromosome would affect the mental and physical ability of the person. So the person would get Down syndrome. To do this, to detect this condition non-invasively is actually very challenging technically. The reason is, in mother's blood, although the baby's DNA can be found, but it only constitutes approximately 10% of the DNA, and the remaining 90% of the DNA actually comes from the mother herself. So to detect an extra copy of chromosome 21 is very difficult, given that only a small proportion of the DNA comes from the baby. So when I started my PhD study, my Dennis told me that you need to work very hard because scientists all over the world actually are working on the same problem. So if you are the second one to solve a problem, then you are the first loser. So you need to be number one to win the game. So after 10 years of, of hard work, we come up with a solution which is very elegant to detect Down syndrome very accurately. So this is the schematic illustration of how we solve the problem. So imagine you have a blood sample with a lot of DNA. 
some of the DNA actually comes from the baby. It's labeled in red. So our invention is that we use a sequencing approach. We sequence millions of DNA fragments from the mother's blood. And after the sequencing, we map it to the reference human genome. The purpose of this is to determine the chromosomal origin of each DNA fragment. Then, after this process, we can count the number of DNA fragments from each chromosome. And because of the extra copy of chromosome 21 in the baby, then we expect there is a minute increase in the chromosome 21 dosage in the mother's blood. And because we sequence millions of DNA fragments, we can detect this change very accurately. After we have developed this method, we use large-scale clinical study to evaluate the accuracy of this approach. And with thousands of cases studied, we proved that this approach is, the accuracy is 99.7%. And this is actually the best diagnostic test using DNA analysis to date. And because of its robust performance and non-invasiveness, the technology we developed is actually very rapidly adopted by the world. So nowadays, up to 10 million tests were performed using our technology every year, in last year. And it leads to a substantial reduction in the number of invasive procedures, including amniocentesis, as I have mentioned. Afterwards, we think that this technology may not be limited to prenatal testing because the, placent the invasiveness of the placenta is very similar to the invasiveness of a cancer so that the approach that we developed can also be applied for the detection of cancer. And we think that this can be translated to a universal cancer test, a non-invasive cancer test to test for all types of cancer. And this is what we developed for detection of cancer. I use a liver cancer as an example. First, we look at the results. If we analyze the tumor sample after the resection of the tumor from the patient, and I arrange all the 22 chromosomes in a clockwise manner, and you can see many dots here. The gray dots mean that the chromosomal region is normal, and the green and red dots mean that those regions have chromosomal gains and chromosomal loss. So you can see there are some chromosomal gain and chromosomal loss in the tumor tissue. Then let's look at what we observed in the blood plasma using our approach. Basically, you can see an identical pattern if we just look at the blood plasma instead of looking at the tumor tissue. And after the resection of the tumor, we took an other blood sample. And then you can see that all abnormal abnormalities are gone. So that these results suggest that this approach can be used to detect cancer as well as to monitor the progress of the patient. So now, and also, because this approach, the copy number changes are universal for all types of cancer, so this approach can be used to detect all types of cancer. Now we have a pretty good cancer test. But what is the best use of this test? So what is the bottleneck of cancer treatment nowadays? It's because of late detection of the cancer. Because early cancers, most of the early cancers are treatable or curable. But for late stage advanced cancer metastat metastasis to different parts of the body, then it's very difficult to treat. So if we have a very good cancer test, then Perhaps we can screen for asymptomatic early cancer so that we can detect these cancers very early and save lives. We use nasopharyngeal carcinoma as a model to prove this concept. So in our study, we studied 20,000 subjects. I spent four years, all the weekends, in recruiting these 20,000 sub subjects. So my golf handicap increased from 18 to 32 in four years' time. So, but after four years, using DNA testing, we detected 34 cases of nasopharyngeal cancer. Before we look at these subjects that we detect the cancer, we screened out the cancer, let's look at what is the stage distributions of nasopharyngeal cancer 
in 2013 in the whole Hong Kong. So you can see that in Hong Kong in 2013, up to 80% of the nasopharyngeal cancer patients presented with stage 3 and stage 4 disease, which means that they have either locally advanced disease or metastatic disease to different parts of the body. So their destiny is very, very difficultly a incurable disease. But if you look at the 34 cases that we identified through screening, almost half of them had stage 1 disease. And stage 1 and stage 2 disease account for up to 70%. So it is a shifting of the late stage cancer to early stage. Then what is going to happen to these patients identified early? Let's look at this survival curve. This survival curve means that the survival of the patients, if the curve is very flat, then it means that no patient is dying. And if the curve drops, it means that a lot of patients are dying. So if we compare the survival curves for those patients identified through screening and in historical cohort, you can see a huge difference. And a hazard ratio of 0 0.1 means that we, through screening, we reduce the cancer mortality by 90%. So in the last 50 years, no single drug can reduce the cancer mortality by up to 90%. So this is the ch it gives the chance, a, a chance of survival to the patients through early detection. And because of this study, it is the first large-scale DNA cancer screening study and proof that DNA analysis can save lives. So we are honored that the most prestigious medical journal, the New England Journal of Medicine, chose our study as one of the 10 notable articles published in 2017. And this is a huge honor similar to winning a Grand Slam title for professional tennis players. So, and the news, the date of the news is important. It is the Boxing Day of 2017. So what's special about this day? Because my first baby was born two hours before I received the notification email from the journal. And I was in the labor ward when I received that email. So I am, I think, Doing science and scientific research is joy and fun and satisfying. But what benefits have we bring to the society? So one important impact that we have brought to the society is we've developed a lot of new things and we found a lot of patterns. Over the last 20 years, I have found 800 patterns globally. And these inventions, because they are very well received by the world. So it, the patents have brought hundreds of millions of royalty incomes to the university and to Hong Kong. So that's an, one part of the impact. But afterwards, in later phase of my career, I feel that licensing all these technologies to overseas big biotech companies may not be of the best interest to Hong Kong, because the young talents in Hong Kong would lack the training and opportunity to develop these technologies further. So the three professors in the Chinese university, Dennis, myself, and Rosa, decided to found our own companies. Up till now, we have found three companies, and the last company we found is Serena, and it merged with another biotech company in the U.S. in 2017, and now the merged entity is valued at 3.5 billion U.S. dollars, and it is one of the most valuable companies in this area. So, and also, we feel that one of our mission is to train and give best education to our next generation. So, in our team of 60 members, up to 20 of, uh, members are receiving postgraduate training, including PhD and master degree. 
And in particular, I would like to share with you one particular person. This is Tony Yong. He is one of the best students in the Hong Kong Certificate examination for his year. But instead of choosing medicine, he chose to study biotechnology. But after his graduation from the master program, he decided to help us to build our companies. And he, when he started, and our first company, the, uh, he grew the revenue of our first company from zero to 100 million in just one year. So he is fantastic. So scientific research is a possible good career for young people. So to summarize, I would like to share with you my view on scientific, a good career. So a good career needs to be interesting. Whether you are successful or fail, then you would not regret of what you have done. It needs to be challenging, so it gives you new problems as well as new opportunities every week, if not every day. It needs to bring some good thing to the world so that people will feel good and you will feel good. And lastly, it needs to give you a reasonable living. But I believe if you bring good things to the world, the world would reward you in a fair manner. Thank you very much.